All right, I, I first want to start off with thank you for having me. Let me tell you guys that an undertaking like this is not an easy thing to do. All right, so I'm going to hand it to Grant because this is truly one of the best things that can happen for anybody in any country. All right, I've spoken around the world. I've spoken in Mexico. I've spoken in the Philippines. I've spoken in Trinidad, Tobago. I'm in South Africa now. The thing that makes the United States good is that I seriously could call up Greg Troy, Bob Bowman, Jack Bowerly right now in my phone. I have their phone number. I could call them. They'd answer my call and they'd say, hey, Todd, what's up? And I could ask them anything and they would give me an answer. Okay? This is not about, okay, I've got to protect what I have over here because I know everything. Baloney! The day that I think I know everything about this sport is the day I hang out my stopwatch and I go do something else. Because every athlete's different. Okay? And we need to understand that the more that we work together, our athletes are going to be better because of that. All right? And I know that's hard. Okay? The reason why we're a coach is you've got to have a little bit of an ego. But I tell people, you've got to check your ego at the door. Okay? When you make decisions for your club or your athletes, you got to think, is it the best for them or is it the best for you? If it's the best for you, it's not the right answer. I'm going to tell you that right now. Okay, there's been many times, and I'll probably talk about this weekend, that Missy could have made the Olymp could have made our world championship team in 2009. She was the second fastest 100 freestyle in the country, 54-0. So, but you know what? I didn't want to send her on a three and a half week trip for maybe just a prelim relay swim when she's 13 years old. How does that benefit her development? It doesn't. Did that make the head coach of the United States pissed? Of course it did. But you know what? Lo and behold, two years later, she won four gold medals in the Olympics. And you know what? The United States truly understands that the Olympics is truly the high point, okay? If you look at our performances at 2015 Worlds from the U.S., we sucked. I mean, really, I think we won 21 medals total. And I mean, man, in the United States, even, man, oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Well, we turned it around and we won 33 medals in the Olympics. We won almost half the gold medals in, in all of swimming. All right? And that doesn't happen by magic. All right? And here's the crazy thing is, literally, I just found this video yesterday. It was posted on my Facebook wall, and I happened to pop it up. And I'm literally watching it, and Grant's sitting over at his computer. And we just start laughing because this is reality, ladies and gentlemen. So just let's, we're going to watch this four-minute video, and then I'll, I'll go into my talk. Todd, you want to grab a couple of the lights down there at the bottom? Yep. It's just some of the switches there. Yeah. 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 Is there any way you can turn the aircon on? Uh, I think or it's full. Cool. Oh, down. Yeah, it's, I think it's at their max. Full best. Son played in the NBA. 
Literally, I took out a second mortgage on the family farm to pay for basketball camps. Things were looking great for a while. Justin made varsity in middle school, but then... Did he get injured? Worse. He stopped growing. He's five, five. Genetics is a cruel mistress. I can't even look my own son in the eye now. It's not because he's so darn little. Is it because you're going to lose the farm? No. Because he's playing on the JV team. But is he having fun? I never asked. Maybe you should, Todd. We're with you, Todd. As a parent, you just want to see your child succeed. Our Daniel could have played in the NHL. He went to all the day camps, straight into night camp, hockey school, hockey hockey. Hockey hockey? Twice the hockey and no school. We thought he was the next Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> he wasn't even the next Brent Gretzky. Hasn't been on skates in 15 years. Early sport specialization can actually hurt a child's overall athletic development. And by encouraging their son to only play hockey, they may have actually hurt his chances for succeeding. But what is Daniel doing now? David doesn't like to speak about it. It might help to share. He's a... My son's an astronaut. <laughs> I still have all his hockey. He still keeps his skates sharpened. He's still draft eligible. He's 34 years old. He's 40. I'll play until he's 50. You need to get over it. I know. But admitting it is the first step. How about you? Would you like to share? I'm Wade. I'm only here because my son made me. And why is that? He says I'm trying to live vicariously through him. Is that true? <laughs> Thanks, well, let's all remember why we encourage our kids to play sports. To win. To be a star. To get rich. We encourage our kids to play sports so they can have fun um, and, and socialize and learn to be part of a team. Is forcing our child to play only one sport and then putting a whole lot of pressure on them to succeed a really healthy thing to do? No. 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 Good. Repeat after me. Kids who play more than one sport get more out of sports. Kids, Kids who play more than one sport get more out of sports. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I love that we can all laugh at that. You know what? The names and faces change on that video, but I, I've coached them all. <laughs> okay? Okay? And I know there's parents sitting in here too. Okay, but you know what? I literally pulled out that video yesterday and I was like, oh my word, this is like perfect for my first talk tomorrow. Okay? Does anybody need the lights on? I think it'll keep it a little cooler in here. You just tell me if you want me to turn the lights back on. Okay? But, I, you know, we laugh at some of those things in there, but there's parents out there like that. All right? And, and really, it's not good. Okay? That was me. Okay, my dad. Okay, growing up, my dad played semi-pro football, not soccer, football, okay, and semi-pro baseball, all right? Baseball was my first love, okay? I loved baseball. Every time I walked off the diamond, my dad would coach me. It just turned me off. Best thing about swimming is my dad didn't know it. Word thing about it. And I would get on a race and be like, good race. I'd be like, no, Dad, that's not good, thanks anyways. <laughs> okay? But truly, I think that's probably why I gravitated towards swimming in the end. All right? Is that as a parent, we're, we got to facilitate our, 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 our kids. But fun. Okay? A happy swimmer is a fast swimmer. All right? Don't forget that. I've never, ever in my entire life seen a swimmer that's mad or grumpy swim the way they want to swim. It just doesn't work. Okay, the mind and body got to be in the same place. So, I know most of you uh, have a little idea of my background, but uh, I'll just kind of give you a little bit. So I was born and raised in Bismarck, North Dakota. That's about 150 miles or 200 plus kilometers away from the Canadian border. Um, I swam on my local YMCA swim team and my high school team. Remember what I said, baseball was my first love. All right, so I never swam year round, okay? High school and uh, club season would finish in March, and in April I would start playing spring baseball, and I'd play baseball all the way through the summer. All right, I can truly honestly say I turned 38 years old yesterday. I can tell you that's why I'm still in the sport of swimming, okay, because I didn't get burnt out. All right, I still learn something new every single day from swimming. All right, and that's the best thing about it. Every day is different for me. All right, I have a degree in finance, okay? Um, 
Let's uh, see here, I'm getting ahead of myself. I was inducted in my high school Hall of Fame in 2013. I moved to Denver in 1997 and never left. I still live in Denver, uh, in one of the suburbs. Swam there for all four years on a swimming scholarship, and I was in inducted into the Metro State University Hall of Fame in 2015. Metro State has now cut their swimming program, so I'm one of the very few last people that will be inducted into their Hall of Fame as a swimmer. Like I said, I graduated in 2001 with a Bachelor of Science degree. Um, there's my Twitter handle, our, our team website. I sat behind a desk for three years after I graduated. And I'm not even kidding you, my alarm would go off and I would just be like, are you serious? I was miserable with life. Oh yeah, I was making over $40,000 a year and I'm 23 and I think, I, yeah, this is awesome. Money's not happiness. I quickly learned that. It doesn't matter if you have money if you're not happy. Some of the happiest people I know probably have a little amount, at least amount of money, probably of any. Because they've realized that it's not about material possessions. It's like Grant said, okay, funding? If you're really going to hold the funding for, oh, we don't get enough funding. Baloney, that's an excuse. Okay, I produced a four-time gold medalist in a 25-yard pool 90% of the time, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody around me said it's not possible. You can't produce an Olympic athlete out of Colorado. You don't have enough long course time. Yada, 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 yada. Well, guess what, man? She's won five gold medals. Guess they're eating crow now. <laughs> Excuses are just that. Everybody can make an excuse. How about instead, you look at what you got and you maximize what you have? That's what it's about. Oh, I want this. This eight lane, 50 meter pool, this is more than I've ever had in my entire life as a swim coach. Okay, the outdoor pool that we rent in the summer, six lanes, 50 meters, was built in 1964 by the United States Air Force. And it's all concrete cinder blocks. The thing is falling into the ground. It still works. It's got water in, it's 50 meters, and we still get the work done. Don't make excuses. Maximize what you have. That's the key to this. Like I said, I started coaching baseball and softball. I did that for three years. I started into swimming as, in 2001 as a grad assistant at, at Metro. Started high school coaching in 2001. Summer club, which is huge. Uh, that's just a, like an eight-week season in the summer that neighborhoods have their pool and they have, we actually have more summer club swimmers in the United States than we do year-round swimmers. Yeah, that's the crazy thing. We have over 300,000 registered members of USA Swimming. Okay, to give you a perspective, Colorado has over 8,000 swimmers. South Africa has 6,000. Okay? So you need to keep that in mind when you're talking about development and medals and things like that. You've got to keep it in perspective, ladies and gentlemen. You only have a pool of 6,000. But that doesn't mean you, all of a sudden you're going to have a team, an Olympic team of 35 athletes. That's not the reality. Okay, because even in the United States we have a huge pool, but not everybody gets to the top. So you've got to understand that. I'm not saying use it as an excuse. Just understand that you have a limited resource and you have to maximize every single athlete in your pool. The way you need to look at it is if when an athlete leaves your practice or quits your team, you just took one out of the ranks from South, South African swimming that doesn't can't maybe reach the next level. When you only have 6,000 swimmers, ladies and gentlemen, you can't afford swimmers to quit. Because when you have swimmers quit, okay, that's when you're going to just stay stagnant and you can't go to the next level. And that, that four minute video we just watched really hits home on that. Fun! What's the first three letters of fundamentals? Fun. I tell you that to every one of my athletes all the time. The fundamentals of fast swimming are streamlines, kick outs, not breathing out my wall, but fun. Fun. I don't care if you're coaching a five-time gold medalist like Missy Franklin. She still wants to have fun. She still needs to have a smile on her face. Now, I'm not standing up here telling you that every single day is going to be fun and we're having, oh, we're going to play games. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. But at the end of the day, they got to be enjoying themselves. That's the key to this. 
And I started coaching stars in 2002 as 800, and this he was seven years old. And so we call that the starfish group. And like Grant said, it was not a plan that I would move with her. It just so happened that we'd have somebody leave the staff and I would get promoted. All right. I took over as head coach and CEO in 2008, so a little over eight years ago. And uh, there you go, just some of my accolades, just so you know why I'm standing up here and you don't full, uh, think I'm full of uh, baloney. All right. Uh, probably the two most things that I'm most, I'm, I'm most proud of is 2009. We won both the Junior National Team Championships, short course and long course. Long course, I had six athletes. Short course, I had four athletes, and not one of them was named Missy Franklin. We're, we're competing against teams that are putting up A and B relays. And I got four girls, and I'm like, well, you're swimming all five relays. There's no chance. There's no option. I remember my breast stroke came to me, and she's like, I was like, all right, ladies, 200 free relay. I was like, all right, we all got to go 24 lows here. My breast stroker looks at me, and she's like, coach, I've never even wrote 26. And I was like, I know, but you got to break it here. <laughs> she went 24-9 on that relay. She swam all four years at Duke University, was an automatic All-American or senior year at the breast stroke. Okay. 2010, USA Swimming recognized me as a developmental coach of the year. That's only all awarded to one coach of the year, one coach of the year out of all the coaches in the United States. I placed the most athletes on our junior national team. I had two on the junior national team and one competed for the U.S. in the Youth Olympic Games. That was the first Youth Olympic Games in Singapore in 2010. All right, and then some accolades from Colorado Swimming. Here's the funny thing is, is that um, 2013, Missy won uh, six gold medals at World Championships, and Colorado Swimming did not award me as their coach of the year. Much because you know what I call things the way I see it, and you know what if you don't like me, I don't care. Okay. I'm going to do what I do, all right? And I call baloney when I see baloney, all right? And so, you know, our, our, our coach of the year in Colorado has turned into a popularity contest. I don't care if you give me that award, okay? I know what I've done, and I know that I've done more than any other coach in Colorado. You want to give me that award, whatever, okay? That's, that's not what I'm doing this for, all right? And I've been on an international staff for the United States every year since 2009, and I just kind of listed them off. 2014 U.S. World Cups. Doha and Dubai is actually where I met Grant, and we've stayed in touch since then. All right, that's my other talk, and we'll get into that. Yeah. All right, I kind of gave over, went over this. There's my email. Feel free to email me. Um, if I don't respond, email me again. Okay, I get a lot of emails, especially when I'm traveling abroad. Okay, because of the eight hour time difference, when I'm sleeping, everybody's working. I wake up to 40 emails. Okay, sometimes it gets buried in my inbox. All right, I don't, int I don't intentionally do it, but obviously uh, my, my work takes priority, but I will get to you. So if, you, if I don't answer you, please just shoot me another email um, and, and I'll try to get back to you. There's our team website. And, and I know that it's USA Swimming, but guess what? USA Swimming's invested millions of dollars into our website. South Africa doesn't have millions of dollars. So who cares? Use this website. I'm telling you right now, use this website. It's got articles about for parents. It's got articles on nutrition. It's got articles about training. It's got all kinds of different resources on there. Use it. Almost all of them are available to the general public. You don't have to log in. You don't have to be a USA Swimming member. Okay? Use it. Okay? And they're actually coming out with a whole new redesign in the next couple months. One of my favorite quotes of all time, right here. Not how many times you get knocked down, but how many times you get up. I forgot to say, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask, all right? So, my talk this morning, okay? Developing, I think Grant called it creating the teenage champion. I like to call it developing our, our youth, our development of, of our junior swimmers. And I think these are some of the key components that you just saw in that four minute video, ladies and gentlemen. Encourage multiple sports for developing athletes. Almost every single one of our 12 and unders on our program does some other sport, at least one. Some of them do like one sport every season. Swimming's the only sport that goes like 11 months out of the year, ladies and gentlemen. If a kid only does that, 
you heard it. Kate, the, the, the kind of counselor sitting in there, you know, as she makes some comments, those are all facts. Okay? The more a kid specializes when they're younger, the more likelihood of them having a repetitive use injury. Like their shoulder blows out, or their knee blows out, or whatever it is. You need to encourage that. Okay, in the United States, okay, there's this alarming trend that we've taken physical education out of the schools. Okay, so what does that do? It makes us not get athletes. You want to laugh sometime, have your kids take a tennis ball, tell them whatever, you know, you're right-handed, have them stand two feet away from the wall, have them throw a tennis ball and see if they can catch it. I'm not even kidding you. That's just basic, basic athleticism, eye and coordination. It's going away in our, in our country, I'll tell you that right now. Because of this alarming trend. The reality is, is that in swimming, we usually don't get the athletes. We don't. We get the kids that are cut from basketball or football or soccer or they just weren't good. They come to our sport. We've got to deal with that and we've got to make them better. Okay, if you have an athlete that can't do a flip turn, tell them to get out of the water and have them try and do a somersault. I'll guarantee you they probably can't even do a somersault. Start on the land and have them do somersaults over and over and over again, and then when they get in the water, holy cow, a flip turn will hit like that. I promise you. When you put them in water, it changes how they feel it. Get them out of the water, manipulate their hand, put it in the right position. So they get that muscle memory, so that when they go into the water, they know what it feels like. It's the number one thing I tell my 1,200 coaches all the time. I'm like, listen, if the group's not listening to you, stop, have them hop out, and get their attention. That's key. I can't, I can't believe how many times I've watched coaches to say something to a group, and literally there's like three athletes listening. Come on, that's like banging your head against the wall. Don't be afraid to pull them out and manipulate their body, whatever it is. Avoid burnout. Gosh dang, these things go hand in hand with avoiding burnout. You know, I, I encourage you to Google, just Google Todd Schmitz after this, all right? You can pull up some articles that were written. Man, in 2011, the Wall Street Journal, all right, posted an article, How Not to Ruin a Child Prodigy. That's about me and Missy. Nice title, huh? Yeah. But it just talks about. Yeah, I love the maybe likes to go his own unorthodox training. No, I just, I want to have fun. And, and even Missy Franklin's got to have fun. Monday's Halloween, okay? I literally, I leave here tomorrow night, I fly all night, I land in Denver at 3 o'clock, my workout starts at 3.15, I'm hopefully on deck at 4, alright, Monday's Halloween, okay, all my age group programs are off because they all want to go trick-or-treating, my older kids just says they'll swim, so we'll have a two-hour workout from 3.15 to 5.15, and we do, we swim for about an hour and 20 minutes, and then we do pumpkin relays, yep, we go buy big pumpkins, and we put them in all six lanes, and literally my coach and I, we just rotate, and we, we come up with relays. Like, our, our pool is three and a half to five feet deep, all right? So maybe we might have them run it down and run it back over their head, where you got to kick it, where you got to put it between your legs. It's fun, okay? When my older kids walk off the deck that on, on Monday, man, they are beaming from year to year, and they never forget it, okay? That's what I'm talking about, fun workouts. Thanksgiving, we actually turkey bowl, okay? Turkeys that are frozen and they're in the mesh bag and they got a handle? Yeah. We set that up on deck. Okay? We, we take water bottles and we set them up like pins. And we put them in a group of three or four. All right? And my older kids, maybe the first rounds fly. And we say, all right, however many pins you have left, it's 100 flies. All right? You didn't knock down five pins. This group needs to go swim five 100s fly. They're going to do it as fast as they can because they want to get out and you're going to have another turn of ball. You're disguising work with fun. That's what it's about. Stop thinking that they just need to look at the black line repeatedly to get better. No way. Okay, you're gonna see, today when I run the clinic is today and tomorrow, 
man, I got all kinds of fun things, like partner kick. Yeah, you kick your partner in front of you like they're the board. Yeah, it's fun. And then you get to the other end and you switch. Or you do partner pull. The person in front is pulling their partner. Okay? You don't need any equipment for that. You already got the people standing next to them. Hey, partner up. All right, we're going to partner kick. All right, you use your board or your kick, but you know, it's just different things. It's different. It's not just a set written on the board, ready to go. And man, I'll tell you what, just listen to them giggle and laugh and, hey, put your toes, come on, man, this is making this too hard. Like, that's what it's about. Because even the person being kicked or pulled, it's all about them knowing their body and how do they get themselves in the best streamlined position so they can go the fastest, all those things. Okay? So, so busting out fun workouts, even for my older kids, I think that's key. Fun. Why does every person come to our sport of swimming anyways? <laughs> because they probably had fun at some point. Maybe be a lake, a river, an ocean, or a pool, or wherever. They came to it because it was fun. Now the definition of fun swimming when we're in eight and under is when we walk into a meet and there's a trophy as big as us, right? You're like, oh, I want that trophy. Okay? That's an external motivation. Extrinsic motivation, okay? Or when we get older, do we, do you guys have trophies that big anymore for older kids? Our older kids barely even get a ribbon anymore. So if they're only motivated by that external motivation, holy cow, when they get older, they're going to be pretty sad. Because there's no trophies that big anymore. Okay, if our results even get into our newspaper, I mean, it is the smallest writing you can ever imagine. That's if they get into our newspaper. Most of the time they don't. So that motivation's got to turn from an external motivation to an internal motivation. Because the definition of fast swimming when you coach older kids is what? When you go to a taper meet and they swim fast. That's what's exciting for older kids. It's when they get to see the hard work benefit them. I tell my kids all the time, if we play water polo every day, we're probably going to have a good water polo table. We're not going to be very good at swimming. I said that earlier. When I talk about fun, don't get me wrong. We still get the work done. Okay? But you also got to read your group. And some days, I walk in and I got my set written on a piece of paper, and we do warm up, and I'm like, wow, that ain't happening today. Don't be afraid to do that. I can tell you now that at 38 years old, I'm a heck of a lot less worried about what that bottom line says or the total meters or yards than what my goal is for that workout. And if I have to stop for a five minute conversation and talk about freestyle catch because they're all dropping their elbow and we need to talk about that, then I do it. And when I say that, guess what ladies and gentlemen, my practice time is very set. And when I say that, my workout needs to finish at 5.30 p.m. because my next groups are getting in. I can't, I don't have the option of going 10 minutes over. I don't have that because my age group coaches are going to be standing there going, hey, what the heck, you're taking my time. And that's not fair to anybody. So I have very strict guidelines on when I get, when I get my lanes and when I get have practice time. And i got to adhere to those because if I don't adhere to them as the boss, that every other coach is going to feel like they can do that same thing and it's just going to cause chaos. So, when I say that, fun. I think sometimes we all need it. I'm not even kidding you on my, on, on, when I used to have a desktop at home right on the top. I'd say fun. Don't forget fun. All right, overview of our program. Okay. Uh, not standing up here saying this is the only way to do it, okay? Because each one of us have a unique situation. If you have fewer athletes, you're obviously not going to be able to break into all these different groups, okay? And that you don't have to. I'm just telling you how 225 athletes in my program are, are divided up. We mainly go by age, all right? So our starfish group, okay? We do a little. We do let on a small. Stroke lessons that's mainly just younger siblings of our athletes, but we really don't have pool space for that. Um, so our starfish group is our eight and unders. 
Okay, to even join that group, an athlete needs to be legal in three out of four strokes. And obviously the fourth one is usually either breaststroke or butterfly that they're not legal in. I know some parents get really mad. What do you mean? My kids never swam. How are they going to know all three strokes? Well, I'm just telling you that if we want to set your athlete up for success, they need to be at that level. Otherwise, they're going to be miserable, and they're going to probably tell you after about the second day of practice, I don't want to go. Even a seven-year-old, yeah. So we need to understand that, okay? So that's why we have that requirement. Our red group then goes to 8 to 11. Notice there's going to be a slight overlap in some of these groups, all right? I'm going to tell you this. I think, as a coach, the hardest decision that we have to make is when a kid needs to move up. You don't get do-overs. I can stand up here and tell you names of athletes you've never heard of that we moved up too soon, and within one year they were gone and they never swam again. That's what we don't want. You don't get do-overs. You don't put them into the red group and they go, ah, you're not ready for the red group. We're going back down to starfish. <laughs> you don't get do-overs. Missy Franklin had two Olympic trial cuts before she moved out of her age group program. Yeah. It's the best thing when a parent loves, you know, they tell me, wow, my kid needs to be in the older group. And then I sit down and I have a face-to-face -face meeting with them and I go, oh, okay, so how many how many junior national cuts does your athlete have? Well, none. Okay, well, how many sectional, which is kind of our regional meet? How many sections? Well, none. Okay, is your athlete still getting better? Well, yeah, but they're the fastest one in the group. They, 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 they win every set. So what? Are they getting better where they're at? And if they are, then I'm going to tell you most of the time the answer is they probably should move up. And the best thing is, is when, and it's more, mainly girls, right? Because they hit puberty earlier, all right? So a girl might mature. Okay, Missy at 12 years old was 5'11". Okay? She's now 6'1". Sorry, I don't know that in centimeters. Okay? But I say that because myself, I was, I was still the age group coach and my head coach. We would have a discussion all the time. She did not move out of our age group or our black group because we didn't have silver group yet. Our black group program, or our top age group level, until she had two Olympic trial cuts. That means she's one of the best 2,000 athletes in the entire country. And she was still in our age group program. Because she was getting better. Why do we got to rush them along here, people? They got their lives to do it. Come on. But you know what? Sometimes, guess who it is? It's the head coach. Well, no, nah, come on, this, they need to be in my group. You said that, right? Remember what I said at the beginning. Ask yourself when you're making a decision, who's it best for, you or the athlete involved? If the answer is you, it's probably not the best look for the athlete. Period. And that's from many years of experience. 2009, Missy and I made the decision, well really I made the decision at the end of the day, that she wasn't going to go to World Championship Trials. She would have made our world team, would have swam on that relay. Well, 2009 juniors a month later, she broke all kinds of records, put 158, 200, yard, 200 meter freestyle. Those would have never happened if she would have gone to Worlds, because she didn't get those chances to swim that day. So that was me. Would it have been a feather in my cap to put a 12 year old on the 2009 World Championship team? You're darn right it would have been. And think about that. That was seven years ago. I mean, I was barely 30, 31 years old. I never coached an athlete to that level. I, have, I honestly, I can look back and go, gosh dang, I was pretty smart. I didn't even realize how smart I was. That's the reality. White group. This is the group that we just came up with in about the last two years. Like I said, it started last year. <coughs> and these were athletes that would come to us that probably didn't have quite the skill set that they could to go into our mainstream groups, but we need to bring them in because guess what? Those are the athletes 
then all of a sudden they hit puberty and they mature, and holy cow, those are the ones that are going to probably be your best older kids. Not even kidding you. Okay, white group, the first group that we ever had of the white group, okay, I have an athlete now that's a senior in high school. She was a 112 100 yard backstroke. She now goes a 58 100 yard backstroke. If we didn't have the white group, she would have never been part of our program. That was one of those gaps that I identified when I took over in 2008 and I said, what can we do to fix this? Black group, like I said, our black group used to be just 11 to 14 years old. So for two years, you know, one of those things in business, because I have a degree in finance, one of those things they teach you in business is you don't want to make knee-jerk reactions. You don't want to make knee-jerk decisions. So for two years, I watched our age group program that I coached all the way through. And I just watched and I, and, I looked, and I tried to identify where our holes were. And I really identified that our 11, 12 year olds that were in the black group were probably not getting what they